West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Malcolm, um, I, I need to get I need to get your reaction uh, at that moment that they cut your mic. What message were uh, you trying to continue to get across? You know, Jonathan, we've talked about the states as laboratories of democracies, but now states are the absolute battlefield of our democracy. And you laid it out um, completely correctly in your in your open. This bill, SB 106, you know, I've called it a crap sandwich. Um, We've talked about what it would mean in terms of putting Pennsylvania on a path to effectively ban abortion in the Commonwealth, where currently abortion still remains safe and legal. But they also have in that same bill, Jonathan, um, stringent voter ID. They want to allow the Republican Auditor General to audit elections. Um, And the Auditor General said he doesn't even know if the last election was free and fair. And so this is going to be the person they want to put in charge of auditing elections. Um, This is what the Republicans have been doing consistently. They understand that Governor Wolf will veto their anti-abortion legislation. And I think a lot of them are worried that Josh Shapiro is going to beat Insurrection Doug, who's the Republican Republican nominee. And so what they have done is try to move this process through the constitutional amendment process, which the governor cannot veto. And so for everybody who cares about abortion rights, we have to do something that I don't think we're always focused on doing. And that is putting our energy, our money, our time, our activism into state house elections. Republicans have controlled Harrisburg for 30 years. And if they win in November, they will put this bill back on the floor in January and abortion as we as we know it in Pennsylvania will most likely be gone. And Malcolm, one, one more question to you on this. Yeah, you know, they'll put it back. Uh, they'll have to vote on it again. And then if it passes, then it goes uh, on the ballot for the people to decide in November 2023. It, it, it can be. And here's the here's the challenge with this. Once they approve it a second time, the speaker can put it on the ballot whenever he wants. And what they have done consistently with these ballot questions is put them on the ballot during low turnout elections. We saw them do it to try to stop the governor from his COVID mitigation efforts. They put it on the ballot during the low turnout um, you know, primary election. And as you know, municipal elections, which we'll have in May of 23, are usually low turnout affairs. And so they're going to make the gamble that if they lose the governor's mansion, that they can try to go around um, our future governor, Josh Shapiro, and put this on the ballot when they think people won't, won't turn out and won't pay attention. This is, the fir- this is not the first time Republicans have turned off my mic. They do it every time I have something to say, but all of us have to continue to speak out, to stand up and to focus our energy on state legislatures. I mean, I'm yelling it at the top of my lungs because Mm -hmm. this is where so many of our basic freedoms are gonna be decided and defended. 
Well, anytime they cut off your mic, um, Representative Kenyatta, you know you can come here to have your voice heard. Ro Robin Marty, let me bring you in here because there are a lot of practical considerations um, that folks never thought they would have to even consider in the, you know, when we were living under under Roe. And so I just want to tick through some and, and have you um, explain why this is a, a big deal in the in the there's a, a, a profile of Michigan Governor uh, Gret Gretchen Whitmer about how she had been, you know, planning for the for this situation um, for months now. And there was one line in there that jumped out at me. And that was when she said she told her daughters to immediately delete their period tracking apps from their phones. Why? Why was that? Why is that a necessary thing to do? So, first of all, thank you for having me on, and it's really an honor to be on with Representative Pinata because I think he really brings into focus, A, both how much states matter, but also how much Republican and especially white Republican legislatures will silence the black voice. Um, we had the exact same thing happen here in 2019 when our total abortion ban passed, where the few handful of black legislators that we have who are all Democrats, and in fact, all but one of our black legis Democrats one of our Democrats are black. Um, they were silenced. They were. They ended up doing a sit-in, singing "We Shall Overcome" during the vote because nobody would listen to them. Um, when it comes to period trackers, I know a lot of people look at that as a big thing that should be removed in order to make sure that nobody is seeing a person's medical privacy, is seeing when they could potentially become pregnant. I feel that in general, it's kind of a symbolic thing to get rid of your period tracker. There are period trackers that do not store information and that can be kept completely on a phone. Yuki is an app that does that. So there is there are ways that you can continue to monitor your own fertility. Um, what we are more worried about as activists are the idea of are people being careful in their Google searches? Are they using private mm. browsers? Are they making sure not to text people if they have a pregnancy and they're not sure how they feel about it? Because those are the things that consistently have been used and on people who either have tried to end their own pregnancies, but also who have just had miscarriages, those have been seized and used as proof that they were ambivalent about their pregnancy, and hence they must have tried to do their own abortion. You know, I want to um, um, tell the prompter to scroll up to, to question five, because this is a very, this is a very long, a very long question. Um, I want, uh, Robin, here's one of the, the latest clever yet risky ways uh, around abortion access. In a Washington Post article by Christopher Rowland, he details how an abortion advocacy website called Plan C has tested the use of commercial mail forwarding services as a bridge between abortion friendly states and banned states by sending garbanzo beans in the mail, mimicking how the process would be sending abortion pills. Uh, the president's executive order ensures mobile, mobile clinics near the borders of states. But if that is still out of reach for people, is this really an option that needs to be considered at this point? So we do know that forwarding options are a thing that can work. We also know that that will put maybe not the person who is going to receive the medication, but that can put um, if they have somebody that they know personally in a legal state forwarded over, that could put that person in some sort of legal jeopardy. Um, a lot of states are, especially Alabama right now, has a essentially a personhood amendment in our constitutional amendment that says that the state has the right to to do anything necessary in order to support unborn life. And so if there was somebody who mail forwarded into an illegal state, that person could be charged maybe not for helping with abortion, but over mail fraud or prescription fraud. The reality is that in a post row America, especially in very red states like Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, we have district attorneys, we have officers, we have sheriffs, we have the attorney general who is searching for a way to punish people and they say that they are not going to punish the person who is having the abortion but the reality is that this discretion is going to be used and a crime is going to be found because it is vitally important for them to find a way to isolate any person who is trying to terminate their own pregnancy they know that people are always going to seek a way to end their own pregnancy and so the only way to not arrest that person and still stop them is to put every person who might possibly help them in fear. 
Um, the next thing that um, I found fa fascinating because I never thought of this it was a story, I believe it's on the front page of the New York Times, about um, IVF treatments and the, the legal quandaries now facing now facing people who are looking into into IVF and the notion that, you know, um, eggs and embryos being stored in various states, depending on where your eggs are stored, that could determine whether you are at some kind of legal risk of, of um, being in violation of a state's uh, anti-abortion laws. The reality is that we just aren't quite sure what any of this means yet. Um, in Alabama itself, our abortion ban explicitly says that you can still do in vitro fertilization. However, that goes against the Amendment 2 ban that I talked about before that says that the state has the right to protect fetal life at any moment after conception. So our problem right now is that we don't know how these two go together. And wow. what it is being set up as is the idea that a Essentially, it lets the government pick and choose which things do they want to say. Is this person going to be in trouble for doing IVF? Maybe. Is this person? Maybe not. And this is a completely unjust way to cast laws. It is Monday, the 11th of July of 2022. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is River City Hash Mondays. Oh my, what a weekend. You know, I keep telling everybody, Rust never sleeps. And uh, in this situation, the Nazis are the Rust. Yeah, they don't sleep, they just keep uh, corroding everything that we hold near and dear because that's what nazis do okay well uh yeah so we've got bannon who says that he wants to testify on live tv in front of the january 6th committee and we all know what that's going to be about it will be turned into a circus it'll be a forum in which to perpetuate the big lie and all the little ones that make up the big lie. And uh, pretty much uh, give what is an unreasonable doubt. Because this whole thing has been unreasonable in its uh, purpose of promoting doubt. It's on purpose. And uh, then we find out that uh, late last night, after midnight, it looks like the DOJ has determined that Bannon's lawyers lied to them. Which brings us to a little peek that I have right now, and that has to do with our media. They keep also perpetuating this lie that Trump can offer or rescind executive privilege. He is no longer the president of the United States. Only Joe Biden can determine what is executive privilege or not. Not Donald Trump. So why do they keep saying, oh, well, Bannon's going to testify because uh, Trump rescinded the executive privilege? Well, first of all, we're finding out that Bannon's lawyers lied to the DOJ about the supposed executive privilege uh, provision to begin with. It was never extended to Bannon because he was not part of the government. Let's be clear about that. You don't have executive privilege when you're talking to some private citizen who wants to can convince you to overthrow the government. So, you know, and I think also executive privilege doesn't apply when a crime is being committed or planned. So there's that, too. So why does the media keep perpetuating this lie that Trump has some sort of power to rescind executive privilege or extend it? It's a bald-faced lie on its face. And that's why it's bald-faced. Oh, makes me livid. Yeah, a peak. A peak is not quite uh, descriptive of how I feel. And livid is just a polite way of saying I am totally effing pissed. 
Because then we not only have that, but then we have supposed allies corroding us from within. What's that all about? <laughs> Everything is Joe Biden's fault. Looks like we re- looks like inflation is being mitigated and it doesn't look like recession is happening. Looks like a pretty robust market. And here I keep hearing all the time about, oh, Joe Biden's tanking the economy. Well, gas prices are coming down. They're going to blame him for that. The gas prices are coming down. He's trying to take our economy. First, gas prices were going up. Oh, he's trying to gouge us. <laughs> Joe? It's not Joe trying to gouge us. So, and and I know that that doesn't necessarily come from within our allies, but that's all part of a whole. That Joe hasn't given me a pony. And yet, I have to say that there's been quite a bit of pushback on all fronts. I will admit I'm not very happy about a pro-life, anti-choice uh, cracker being uh, uh, appointed to the federal bench in Kentucky in some sort of deal with uh, the Grim Reaper. Got to keep telling people, you know, look, there's no negotiating with the Nazis. You got to punch them. (laughs) Are we going to Chamberlain our way through all of this? Go to sleep. Everything's fine. Give me a break. But on other fronts, Joe's doing pretty good at punching the Nazis. I just wish that, you know, this other thing about uh, the optics look bad. But then on the other hand. We don't hear about the hundreds of jurists that he's been able to get through in spite of McConnell's uh, intransience in trying to muck up the judiciary against Democratic presidents and their sympathizers. I would propose that the only way to bring the country together is to get rid of the Nazis. You can't bring him into the fold. Oh, I know. I know. We brought in Werner von Braun and we got to the moon. I know. I know. We brought in a bunch of uh, Nazis and they helped us, uh, you know, fortify our intelligence apparatus. I know. Like nothing would go wrong with that. Isn't it funny? Now we have a DHS. Department of Homeland Security. What's that about? Sounds pretty teutonic, huh? <sighs> and now Bushko, he's a paint by number artist and everybody loves him. He's so cute. The Carters have been married for 76 years. Who does that? Well, apparently socialist commies because everybody apparently hates Carter. Oh, he's a loser. One of the best presidents we ever had, in spite of, you know, the uh, the emphasis on the Christian aspect of his, uh, I don't know, southernness, shall we say. I could have had a little less of that, but Carter was a good guy, and he's still a good guy. Bushko? Jeez. Yeah, he's like a cute little gnome that you put out in front of your yard now, not realizing that that's the guy that kind of, you know, brought in, uh, you know, the rest of these Nazis. You got Brett Kavanaugh, part of the uh, the Brooks Brother rioters, and I think Gorsuch was there, too. So and now they're on the bench. How'd that happen? Uh huh. And then every time we try to use just one little rule, uh, they shut it down and say, nope, you can't do that. I call that government nullification. You got jury nullification, now you got government nullification. Uh Okay, well, I guess we have our work cut out for us now, don't we? And let me also remind the youngins out there, I know they're not listening to this show because we're a bunch of old boomers. Hey, boomer! Just because you didn't get a pony and you voted like three or four times max, you want to give up now? It's not as if hundreds of years of trying to get, you know, full citizenship rights for our former slaves 
We didn't get it in the beginning, so oh, let's just give up on it. Yeah. I mean, uh, going shopping is more important than punching the Nazis anyway. Yeah, that's exactly what a Nazi would say. Go shopping. We'll have a terror alert, and hey, you can still go shopping, though. Remember that? Best way to fight the terrorists is to go shopping. The best way to fight the Nazis is not to go shopping. It's to stand your ground and punch them. Punch them in the wallet. Punch them in the ballot box. And uh, hopefully we don't actually have to punch them. But it may come to that. Because you know they have the guns. <laughs> they think they have them all. That's their problem. They think they have them all. They've been doing pretty good at amassing their arsenal, though, haven't they? With help from what it looks like is a stacked court that has been working against the interests of the United States of America. At what point do we agree among ourselves that the enemy is within and our job is to fight Enemies of the Constitution, foreign and domestic, and I suppose it happens to be with the packed maggot court. You know, it's hilarious how Morton's uh, is all upset because Kavanaugh was having dinner there. And uh, Kavanaugh didn't even know that there was a protest going on outside the restaurant on the sidewalk, by the way, where it's supposedly legal because that's where the court said it was. And they didn't do it at all at any hour of the day or night, like the court said it was, you know, anti-abortion protesters were allowed to go to the homes of doctors, nurses, even patients, use bullhorns, Klieg lights, any number of things as long as they stayed on the sidewalk. Even noise ordinances and curfews didn't matter then as long as they stayed on the sidewalk. So when peaceful protesters, who happen to be the actual neighbors in the community where these jurists live, walk peacefully with candlelight across in front of their house on the sidewalk, apparently that's been raised to a potential terrorist act. And then they point to this crazy guy who called the cops on himself and said, I think I want to kill Kavanaugh. And why did he want to kill Kavanaugh? To make sure that he overturned Roe with a vote and that he stiffened gun rights so that more people could have guns like him. But that guy gets grouped up with the peaceful geriatric set walking silently in front of, an, of the Supreme Court justices' homes on the sidewalk, exactly where the court said that anti-abortion protesters could protest at any time of day or night with any kind of implement they could bring. And they did, to the point of blowing up clinics, blowing up nurses and receptionists, shooting and killing doctors while they're in church. And somehow, in Kavanaugh's mind, a guy who was pounding on the windows in Dade County back uh, in 2000 saying, Stop the count! Stop the count! That guy is upset because people are walking on the sidewalk disagreeing with their royal decree. Because that's what it is. It's not democratic. It's a royal decree. They are kings. They are princes. And the princess, too. Now, I know I'm lumping our guys and gals in there, too. But, hey. I'm not. I'm talking about the maggot court. And that includes John Roberts, the balls and strikes umpire judge who just keeps calling foul balls in play. And a hit 
with runs for the GOP every time. Well, most of the times. Let's not be absolutionists now. We can't do that. Or absolutists. There we go. It's Monday morning. I still need more coffee. Well, speaking of which, <laughs> that just reminded me we have a curated show for you today, and we better get on it. Yes, uh, oh, I don't know if you can hear that loud engine. Pretty soon we won't have to hear that kind of stuff anymore because electrical engines are actually much quieter. But you know, all the people that want to go roll and smoke, when the only thing to get is uh, electrical cars, they're going to figure out some way to roll smoke anyway. They're going to put some kind of loudspeaker on their car to make it rev up. And uh, really disturb the neighborhood at, uh, you know, early in the morning. Okay, what do we have in store for you today here as we begin in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? The jobs report for June found the U.S. private sector has regained every job loss during the pandemic. And somehow uh, that's bad for Joe. The Biden administration is sending billions of dollars to upgrade airports after Trump failed to help them. And somehow that'll be bad for Joe. And nearly a year after the DOJ opened an investigation into Phoenix police brutality, Arizona has made it illegal to videotape cops beating the crap out of somebody. And I fear that the... The far left in the Democratic Party is going to blame Joe for that. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where the Russian alternative to McDonald's is facing a French fry shortage. And the U.S. is terminating its four-decade-old tax treaty with Hungary over that country's resistance to implementing a global minimum tax. All that and more... On West Coast, cookbook and speakeasy. Bon appetit. Radio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. Across the page to the left from that chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And please send us money because we need it to pay our bills. Send us maybe what you might spend on an espresso type coffee drink. If you could send that to us once a month, we're able to pool those dollars with other dollars and including what we pull out of our own wallets. And that way we do pay our bills and that way we are able to fly under the radar and continue this powerhouse of resistance. And we have you to thank for your generosity in allowing us to fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended so many years ago. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime, so you, you could get them directly from there. But you can also find the links to the show notes and links diaries on Daily Co's on Twitter and, uh, you know, other social media platforms, too. So there. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and really wherever podcasts can be found. And uh, also you can find the deep archive of the Netroots Radio Library at the Internet Archive at archive.org. Hopefully the Internet Archive, I, I we, we put things at the Internet Archive 
uh, pretty much so that they'll be there in perpetuity. But now I'm hearing that uh, the Internet, Internet Archive is in a, um, a court battle with a, some terrible writer who's upset that his books are being uh, shared in the libraries for, I guess, free or something. He's upset about that. Libraries are getting my books. I don't want them to have my books. They got to buy them from Barnes and Noble. Oh, there's no more Barnes and Noble. We'll get it from Amazon then. Okay. So hopefully uh, the Wayback Machine and the Internet Archive will still exist exist after all this so that we don't have to go through another search to find where we can park uh, a considerable amount of shows, 11 years of Netroots radio programming. Okay, not just this show and its previous iteration, too. Just so you know. All right. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy comes out of the American Independent by Emily Singer. A strong June jobs report released on Friday showed that the private sector has now recovered every job that was lost during the COVID-19 pandemic when millions of people were laid off during Trump's tenure. The news came after the Bureau of Labor Statistics announced the economy added 372,000 jobs in, a, in June, exceeding economists' expectations and keeping the unemployment rate at 3.6%. And apparently, Joe is doing so bad for the economy. The milestone came a little more than two years after the COVID-19 pandemic began, which caused the stock market to plummet and employers to slash 22 million jobs. The private sector has bounced back faster than many had previously thought it would. Some economists had predicted it could take as many as four years for the millions of jobs that were lost to return. Well, the White House celebrated the jobs number, touting the speed of the recovery from the pandemic slump. Too bad our corporate media wouldn't report it. Oliver Willis from the American Independent brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. Joe Biden's administration announced uh, that $1 billion from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act will be used to finance upgrades and repairs to 85 airports across the U.S. The federal funding was made possible by the Bipartisan infrastructure law, which allocates a total of five billion to the FAA airport terminals program over the next five years, as the Federal Aviation Administration. The announcement comes after Trump specifically highlighted problems with airport infrastructure, but failed to pass significant infrastructure legislation during his presidency to address them. In a release, the White House said that the grants being awarded to local airports would be used to expand capacity at our nation's airport terminals, increase energy efficiency, promote competition, and provide greater accessibility with individuals with disabilities. The administration said the upgrades would improve customer experience and allow goods to be moved more efficiently, increasing U.S. competitiveness.
Chang of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Arizona's governor has signed a law that restricts how the public can video police at a time when there's growing pressure across the U.S. for greater law enforcement transparency. Civil rights and media groups oppose the measure that Republican Governor Doug Ducey signed. The law makes it illegal in Arizona to knowingly video police officers eight feet or closer without an officer's permission. Oh, but... You think eight feet is okay? Well, wait until they start doing it to you from across the street because they have a provision for that as well. Someone on private property with the owner's consent can also be ordered to stop recording if an officer finds they are interfering or the area is not safe. The penalty is a misdemeanor that would likely incur a fine without jail time, but you know they're going to beat the crap out of you beforehand. There needs to be a law that protects officers from people who either have very poor judgment or sinister motives. You know, like turning the stuff over to a grand jury. The move comes nearly a year after the Department of Justice launched a widespread probe into the police force in Phoenix to examine whether officers have been using excessive force and abusing people experiencing homelessness. It's a similar it is similar to other investigations opened in recent months in Minneapolis and Louisville. The Phoenix Police Department, which oversees the fifth largest city, has been criticized in recent years for its use of force, which disproportionately affects black and Native American residents. Indeed. All right, let's get to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, when truth is scarier than fiction, sometimes the baddest, most memorable villains come from real life. James Whitey Bulger is a perfect example. Bulger became one of the most notorious and powerful underworld figures in the Northeast thanks to his alliance with the local FBI branch. Black Mass, which is based on the book by the same name, looks at that alliance between Bulger and the corrupt FBI agent John Conley, played by Joel Edgerton in a decidedly unglamorous role. Unlike many mob movies, Black Mass doesn't waste time on backstories that aren't relevant. This is smart on the part of director Scott Cooper because there is enough material here for several movies. However, by focusing squarely on Bulger and his rise and eventual fall, the movie has a fast-paced feeling to it that belies the fact it is 122 minutes. While Cooper and the film editor deserve credit for this, Johnny Depp also deserves recognition for his mesmerizing performance as Bulger. While Depp is arguably one of the best actors of his generation, many of his recent over-the-top performances have left audiences cold. This one does not. Bolger's creepiness comes from his subtlety. Depp, who was well known for getting into character, collaborated with longtime makeup artist Joel Harlow to physically become Bolger, right down to his ice blue eyes, which are as cold and unflinching as a Boston winter night. He rarely raises his voice and instead prefers to let his actions speak for him. He's a psychopath in the truest sense of the word and commits some of the most chilling on-screen murders in recent cinematic history, even though very little actual violence is shown. While Black Mass may not be the best crime movie of all time, it is nonetheless very good and reminds us that award season is here. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on the Take Two Movie Review page on YouTube. I was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean when it happened. There was a sudden jolt and our submarine crashed on the seafloor. We were in total darkness. 
That's Dr. Dejana Figueroa, a marine biologist and STEM teacher, talking about a deep sea dive she'll never forget. It's funny, when I was a kid, I was afraid of the ocean. And there I was, two miles below the surface. But as a scientist, you prepare for that. Using our training and a little creativity, we fixed the sub and finished our experiments. The dive was just too important. Every dive gives us glimpses at things few people ever get to see. Blowing creatures, fiery undersea volcanoes. When we got back to the surface, I kissed the ground and called my mom, of course. But you know what? I wouldn't trade that dive for anything. Dr. Figueroa uses her passion for STEM to discover new things and make the world a better place. She can STEM, so can you. Check out She Can STEM for more stories and inspiration. A message from the Ad Council. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Heart disease and stroke can be catastrophic. They're leading causes of death, disability, and healthcare spending in the U.S., yet they're largely preventable. Alarmingly, heart disease and stroke are taking a toll on middle-aged adults 35 to 64, with over 800,000 deaths and hospitalizations in 2016. Million Hearts is a national initiative focused on preventing 1 million heart attacks, strokes, and other cardiovascular events by 2022. Coordinated actions by Million Hearts partners in communities, healthcare, and public health will keep people healthy, optimize care, and improve outcomes in populations at risk. Everyone has a part to play. Focus on the ABCs of heart health. A. Aspirin use when appropriate. B. Blood pressure control. C. Cholesterol management. And S. Smoking cessation. To learn more, visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Wouldn't it be great if life came with a remote control? You know, you could hit pause when you needed to or hit rewind. Like that time you knocked down that wasp's nest. Uh-oh. Or that time you forgot to roll up your windows in the car wash. Fantastic. Yeah, a remote control would have come in handy then. Well, life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome, but pre-diabetes does. With early diagnosis and a few healthy changes like managing your weight, getting active, stopping smoking, and eating healthier, you can stop pre-diabetes before it leads to type 2 diabetes. It's easy to learn your risk. Take the one-minute test today at doihaveprediabetes.org. Life doesn't come with a remote control. Yikes! So you're on your own with the wasps. You have the power to take control of pre-diabetes. Visit doihaveprediabetes.org today. That's doihaveprediabetes.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its pre-diabetes awareness partners. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Pools, water parks, and other recreational water venues are popular places to relax and stay cool, but they can be sources of serious illness. Since 2000, nearly 500 outbreaks have been reported at recreational water venues in the U.S., resulting in over 27,000 illnesses and eight deaths. Most were caused by parasites, bacteria, viruses, or certain chemicals in the water. Parents with young children who have diarrhea should not allow their children to swim or play in the water. In addition, bathers should check the inspection scores of pools and water parks and can conduct mini inspections using test strips before getting in the water. A few simple precautions can allow you to share the fun, not the germs. Thank you for joining us on A Minute of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, Show your progressive side and go to the donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our donate button at the bottom of netrootsradio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. In the 1990s, renowned Texas progressive writer Molly Ivins regaled and appalled readers with her reports on the tragicomic awfulness of George W. Bush's two terms as Texas governor. 
His tenure was notable for his deep ignorance, frat boy arrogance, and flagrant servility to corporate interests. But those very qualities made America's moneyed powers decide that, wow, he'd make a dandy president. Molly warned that this was madness, but in the 2000 race, W's patrons stuffed him with money, buffed him up with P.R. Shinola, pulled off a post-election political heist in Florida, and squeegeed him, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Ashcroft, and that whole regime of horrors into office. Americans soon began expressing astonishment at how shallow, imperious, and dangerous Bush and company were proving to be, leading Molly to say, Next time I tell you someone from Texas should not be president of the United States, please pay attention. Don't look now, but another Texas gubernatorial goober named Greg Abbott is coming at you, insisting that he should be your next president. Sadly, Molly is gone, but I think I can speak for her on this matter of national import. Hell no! Excuse the redundancy here, but right-wing extremism has become extremely extreme and Abbott is vying to be the extremiest of all. A clue to his loopiness is his vituperative anti-abortion absolutism, forcing victims of rape to give birth to their rapist spawn. Not a problem, proclaimed Abbott, for he's the Lone Star Wizard. He declared that he intends to go out and arrest all rapists, get this, before they rape anyone. This is Jim Hightower saying, Abbott has run up a record for spectacular program failures, widening inequality, corruption, political buffoonery, and so awful much more. If that's your idea of a president, there he is. If you'd like more of Jim Hightower's real populism, check out the Hightower Lowdown. Jim's monthly newsletter gives you the real lowdown on which corporations, by name, are doing what to the middle class, our environment, and our democracy. Each month, the Hightower Lowdown brings you facts you didn't know, along with actions you can take to fight back. It also comes with a sense of humor. Hightower believes we can fight the gods and still have fun. Plus, get this, it's cheap. Only $15 brings you 12 issues a year. For real populism, go to HightowerLowdown.org. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1892. Striking silver miners in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, blew up the Frisco Mill. The miners were upset because the company had hired Pinkerton guards to infiltrate the mine. Working conditions in the northern Idaho mining district were terrible at that time. Many workers were injured, and some died because of lack of mine safety. When mine owners wanted to purchase new equipment, they cut costs by increasing working hours and decreasing miners' pay. In response, the miners decided to strike. The mine owners, unsurprisingly, brought in scabs. Some scabs were persuaded to honor the strike. The mine owners also hired Pinkertons to infiltrate the ranks of the strikers. One Pinkerton, Charlie Sheringo, was so successful at gaining the confidence of the strikers that he became the union's recording secretary. The infiltrator had access to the union's financial records and relayed all information he uncovered to the mine owners. By early July, Union miners suspected Syringo was a spy. The miners became more militant, and in the very early hours, miners gathered to stop a trainload of scabs from entering the mine. Pinkerton guards were brought in to protect the incoming scabs. A shootout between the guards and the miners erupted. It was unclear who shot first, but the miners retaliated by dropping a box of powder down a flume in the Frisco mill. The box exploded, and one company employee was killed. A battle broke out at a nearby mine, and three miners were killed before owners surrendered. Three mines fell into the hands of the workers by that evening. The governor of Idaho declared martial law and sent in the Idaho National Guard to break the union. These events helped to lead to the creation of the Western Federation of Mining. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Ash Mondays. 
We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River. In the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 61 degrees and we are under an active heat warning. Oh, I'm sorry, a heat advisory. A little bit different than a warning. The advisory states that we will be in exceedingly high temperatures uh, until, well, about 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And yes, we are sunny at the current moment. Our temperature is at 61 degrees Fahrenheit. And we are expecting a high of 106 to 108, which means it could be warmer here at the mothership in Rogue River proper. Winds will be out of the north-northeast at 5 to 10 miles per hour, so we got that going for us. Clear skies overnight with lows in the upper 60s, not quite cool enough. But we'll take it anyway. Winds will be shifting out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then sunny tomorrow along with a few afternoon clouds. And our high is going to only be 98 degrees Fahrenheit with winds out of the west-northwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour. Confirmed cases and deceased of coronavirus in Jackson County were increasing to the end of last week. We don't have updates currently, but I'll give you our totals. Right now, our confirmed cases stand at 471,078, and our deceased stands at 555, and those were increases because I fear we have the B5 variant and uh, the mask mandates have been imposed in Jackson and Josephine counties indoors and out. So keep washing your hands wherever you are. Keep wearing a mask wherever you are and stay away from the idiots. Okay. At least outside at breathing distance. And you know, you know how far that can be. Grass pollen is rated very high outside the window in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region, though, is good at 28 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is very high at level 9. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.04 inches. Visibility is, is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is at a very sticky 95%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 88 degrees and sunny. Paris is 86 and sunny. Rome is 87 and fair. Kiev is 64 and cloudy. Kabul is 75 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 85 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 78 and cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 48 and mostly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 58 degrees, partly cloudy, with a small craft advisory onshore and offshore for fog. And New York, New York is 80 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. And that is... Weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. Burger of the Washington Post brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The recently opened Russian alternative to McDonald's, which left the country in May over Russia's war in Ukraine, is both a fast food chain and a currency in Moscow's propaganda campaigns. In a shortage wrought with symbolism, the Kuzno E. Cho- Kuchka, which translates as tasty and that's it, is limiting the sale of fries this summer because it is unable 
to source enough potatoes. The Russian franchise said it is running low on the menu's country-style potatoes, its thicker-cut cousin of the Americanized French fry, because of supply chain disruptions in part caused by war and Western sanctions. The fast food chain, which opened its archless doors in June, said it typically seeks domestic sources for produce, but a poor potato harvest last year left Russia with limited stock, and the company has been unable to fill the gap with imports of the starch. Tasty and that's it, said potatoes will fully return to its menu this fall after the next harvest. Other main players in the market are facing similar difficulties, the company told TASS. On Telegram, however, Russia's agriculture ministry denied news of a potato shortage. Countries from Japan to Kenya have reported potato and French fry shortages in recent months, similarly citing supply chain and environmental factors. But tasty and that's it hamburger and fries were also meant to be a token of Russian self-reliance forged amid the exit of more than 1,000 companies, among them McDonald's, and rounds of Western sanctions intended to punish and isolate Russia for its war in Ukraine. Je te donne mon amour pour la vie entière la promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers C'est tout Jeff Stein, also of the Washington Post, brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast. Cookbook and speakeasy. The Biden administration said it will terminate its four-decade-old tax treaty with Hungary over that country's resistance to implementing a global minimum tax as the United States seeks to create a global tax floor for large multinational corporations. In a statement, the Treasury Department said the United States is ending the treaty with Hungary because of, quote, the benefits are no longer reciprocal, end quote, citing a loss of tax revenue for the United States and little return for American investment in the country. Hungary, which has one of the lowest corporate tax rates in Europe, is currently blocking the EU's implementation of the global minimum tax agreement. World leaders have agreed on a 15% corporate tax floor, championed as a top priority by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Hungary's corporate tax rate is 9%. Each country in the European Union has veto power over the bloc's tax agreements, and every other EU member country supports the proposal. An analysis by the Treasury Department said the treaty unilaterally benefits Hungary. When the treaty was agreed to, Hungary's tax rate was 50 percent. That's with a five zero. It is now nine, less than half the U.S. rate. Tax treaties are designed to help residents of countries that have signed them to avoid paying taxes on the same income to both nations and to resolve other potentially complicated tax situations. The Biden administration has said the new global minimum tax will help states fund social programs and escape a mutually damaging race to the bottom by competing for business by lowering corporate tax rates. Those efforts have largely unified countries in the EU, with Yellen and her partners winning over holdouts such as Ireland and Poland. But Hungary's resistance has become the latest major roadblock to implementing the plan, 
with Hungarian officials warning that the measure will hurt investment and growth in their country. That brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver